So this is my third week doing this. Uh, thank you guys again for coming on and joining me as I do, as we do this every Monday. Again, we're going to be um, talking about the USF Bulls on their loss to the Temple Owls and previewing their this Saturday's game against the Cincinnati Bearcats. Uh, we will also be talking about the Bucks win yesterday over the Arizona Cardinals and previewing their game this Sunday against the Saints. We're going to talk about the successful global series trip for the Tampa Bay Lightning as they move in and get ready to play the Rangers on Thursday. Your Troy will be in person as a fan. I wish I was there as a media member, but I'll just be there as a fan. Um, and we'll talk again about uh, the Florida Gators, the Knolls, the Owls, everyone else inside the state of Florida as far as college football goes. And at the end of my show, guys, I'm going to talk about Deadly Rival Roller Derby. I attended their bout this past Saturday. Um, if you go on to the website uh, here, uh, our website at uh, Staples at Primetime Network, you can uh, see the pictures and video that I took uh, from the bout. Also, too, this is presented by Mancini Sports Network and everything else and as well so thank them both for working hard to do that well let's go ahead guys and let's get into it um let's get into it and talk about i'm going to start guys with the usf bulls um as you can see guys up here in the corner my microphone is finally working um i got my mic to work finally uh as i recorded my show earlier today the walk report um my microphone is starting to work, which is great because my friend finally is happy to hear that my microphone is finally working. But anyway, guys, uh, let me uh, jump in. I'm going to start with USF. Um, I was at the game covering the game for IROC Media as I have the last two seasons as a media credential member. Um, so I get to go in the press box. I get to go down on the field before the game. If you caught my video of the Temple House warming up. Um, there's there's also uh, photos too as well on my Facebook page. If you don't have my Facebook page and you want a friend request me, it's Bradley Lewis Walker or at Jim Rome Fan 83 at yahoo.com is my contact information as well. Um, follow me on Twitter at Brad Walker 3083 is my um, username on there. You can follow me on there as I post all my shows and articles that I write. Um, but anyway, to get to the game, guys, uh, USF came out flat, and that's kind of surprising. It's kind of disappointing that they have two weeks to prepare. Now, they came off of a 45-23 win over East Carolina two weeks ago, had a chance to get a two-game winning streak and put themselves one win away with three games left for a chance to go to a bowl game. Well, unfortunately – they came out flat, laid an egg, and they lost 17-7 to Temple. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny how in football you have, you know, one or two plays that can mean a whole big difference in a game. And it's funny how in this game that's exactly what happened. And I'll give you the plays in general that I'm referring to. One play was a 53-yard run by the Owls, and they were coming from outside of their, you know, they were in their own side of the field only to run 53 yards. The Bulls missed five tackles on that play. Could have prevented them from getting into the end zone, but unfortunately the Owls were able to get that taking, you know, able to score on that touch. They scored a touchdown there. They also on deep, as the Bulls were deep in there on their own end of the field, Wide receiver Terrence Horn caught a ball and had the ball stripped out of his hand on the turf. And again, the, the Owls returned the ball 35 yards for a touchdown. If you take away those two plays, the Bulls would win that football game 7-3. to three. That's just how two plays, two plays made a difference in that football game. It's very disappointing because USF fans are upset with what – is going on uh, now remember remember this guys remember this is not something that um, this is not something that has has just been happening recently you know you um, Bulls fans 
are tired of losing. You know, they won we won seven games a year ago, lost the final six games, lost a bowl game at Raymond James Stadium to Marshall. That was an embarrassment. We come out of the gate, we play Wisconsin and get our butts kicked at home in front of a crowd. This game, guys, against Temple was on ESPN. Okay, I just the stakes of that are so high. This game was on the, it was the ESPN Thursday night game of the week. Pat McAfee, if you don't know who he is, YouTube, former Indianapolis Colts kicker, one of the funniest people you'll meet. I got to see him and Matt Hasselbeck as well because they're the Thursday night broadcast team for ESPN. They were both there. They were both there. And the funny thing is that, you know, one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in my life, and someone can please tell me, I don't know why Charlie Strong did this or not, but with they had two minute, two plus minutes left in the fourth quarter. The Bulls had the ball deep in their own end of the field with two timeouts. Instead of using the timeouts, they kept them. They turned the ball over on downs, which I don't understand that either. You have to get 15 yards. They throw a 13-yard pass, two yards short of the first down on fourth down. Uh, Cronkite, I'm not sure what he was thinking when he was two yards short. It didn't even look like he even cared to get the final two yards. But the question that I, that, that, that I have with that is, why didn't Charlie Strong use the timeouts? That was the funny thing is, why did he not use those two timeouts that he had? Now, you watch – the post-game press conference, and his answer was, it didn't matter. The game was already over. Well, yes, we know that even if the Bulls would have driven down and got a touchdown, they would have lost by a field goal. Let me just point this out for many Bulls fans and me being one of them. I think it would have stung a little less had we lost 17-14 compared to losing the 17-7, and we could have drove down. It seemed like to me on that final drive that they had just given up. They had given up on the game. They had thrown in the towel, and it was it. It was over with, and that's the way it was going to go. Plain and simple, we're not going to play no more. We're done. We've lost by 10 points. This game is going to Temple because they get the ball after that fourth down missed opportunity, and what do they do? They take two knees, and they walk out of Raymond James Stadium bowl eligible because at the time, guys, Temple was five and three. Now they're six and three. Now they're in a bowl game. Now USF has to win two of the remaining three games they have on the schedule. But think about this. They're not easy. Cincinnati, who's already beat UCF this year, they're off to a good start. Then they play Memphis, who might win the AAC this year, if not SMU, and UCF at the end of the season. And I know, yes, I know the Knights lost to Tulsa, they have three losses this year. That's amazing to, to say that UCF has three losses in a year because they haven't lost that many games in a long time. So for them to lose three games is astronomical, to say the least. And you know what? Maybe that game at the end of the season in Orlando will be more competitive than we all think it might be. And maybe, just maybe, if USF wins this Saturday and they beat UCF to get into a bowl game, boy, that would be something interesting to see how the season would end up if it ended up that way. But this was a game that I thought that USF should have won, and this would have put them in the driver's seat for a chance to get to a bowl eligibility maybe this week coming up against Cincinnati. But remember, Cincinnati, again, is not an easy team. These final three games are not going to be easy for you for USF. And the way that they played against uh, against Temple, they won't win any of these games. So Charlie Strong has got to go back to the drawing board. Kerwin Bell's got to go back to the drawing board because that's been the problem all season, guys, is the fact of the matter is that when it comes down to it, it comes down to the offense not getting on sync. And, yes, there have been games, guys, where USF, their offense has been outstanding. But it's kind of disappointing because supposedly coming into this season, the weakness of this team – as if I wrote, when I wrote it on my article at the beginning of the season that it was supposed to be the defense that was supposed to be the, the, you know, the weak link of this team. Well, come to find out, since they've had three transfers through the transfer portal, it hasn't been like that. 
the defense has actually put the offense in, in you know, opportunities to win football games. The offense has not done what they're supposed to do, and maybe it's because this offense is too complicated. Maybe it's the fact that we don't have the right players in, 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 in place. You know, Blake Barnett's out. You know, you have Jordan McLeod, who, guys, is a redshirt freshman. So, again, he, you're going you're gonna to see mistakes. Mistakes are going to happen with guys that are that young. And maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's a growing pain thing. But the problem is we're losing football games. And, and as I mentioned on the Walker Report earlier this afternoon when I reported it, the thing is what I've been reading on, on you know, message boards for USF, they're calling for Charlie Strong to be fired. A lot of people are not going to renew their season tickets because if Charlie Strong remains the head coach. Guys, as I've been going to the games and as the games dwindle down and as we keep losing games, less and less people are showing up to USF games. Charlie Strong has been begging and pleading with this community itself in whole to get the people to come to Raymond James Stadium and be there. The unfortunate part is when you don't win, no one shows up. And it, it's the, the true diehards will show up, the alumni, you know, the student section. And, guys, at the last game, even the student section on Thursday night, there was really nobody there. I mean, rarely that, that, that section is usually filled no matter what, what is going on. But I guess maybe the students themselves have said, you know what, I don't want to waste my time. I got time. I, I need to go study. I need to go to class. I don't want to go to a game and sit and watch them lose and sit and watch how bad, you know, they are getting beat in, in some cases. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's what it's like. Um, well, what's going on, um, you know, with, with, with that going on? I mean, you know, I, I don't really know. You know, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, you know, what is going on. Um, you know, what's going on with that. But, you, I mean, the, the, the main thing is that they're going to have to turn this thing around rather quickly. Because I'm going to pull up right now. I'm, uh, guys, I'm pulling up uh, to preview. Uh, guys, the, the kickoff for the Cincinnati game, in case you're, you want to go and you want to see them, uh, it's a 7 o'clock kickoff this Saturday um, at Raymond James Stadium. Um, so if you want to attend a game, you, you can definitely uh, come out. I know tickets are very, very wide open. Um, coming into this game right now, outside of SMU, Navy, and Memphis, Cincinnati is 8-1 overall. They're 5-0 and in the conference, 5-0 and at home, and 3-1 and on the road. They're on a seven-game winning streak heading into this game on Saturday night. Seven game winning streak. That's, you know, so you can think about this right now. That means when they started this winning streak, they were one and one. Now they are eight and one. And again, they own a victory over UCF earlier this year. Um, the, the one loss that they have right now, as we speak, is 42 nothing to the Ohio State Buckeyes, who likely will be the number two ranked team in the country after this weekend. I believe LSU will move up to number one. But, again, that's a different scenario, and you can hear more about that on the Walker Report. But that is the only loss that they have, guys. They beat UCLA 24-14. They beat uh, Miami of Ohio, Marshall. They beat, since they beat UCF by a field goal. They beat Houston. They beat Tulsa. They beat East Carolina. And they just got done hammering UConn last week by a final score of 48-3. So if any of the Bulls fans out there, I mean, I'll, I'll be at the game anyway because I'm going to go. And I, I, I enjoy going because I get to go to the game and be up in the box and be with the media. But, you know, if you get a chance to go and you want to go watch a game, maybe just things happen, miracles happen. Maybe this might be the game that you at USF turns it around. Um, I want to let you guys know that I've been, I've been to five USF games this year. And they are one in four in the games that I have gone to. The only win that they have is against South Carolina State. That's the only win that they have. Um, I was on vacation when they played BYU on homecoming, and they won that game on the last play of the game. That would have been amazing to be in the stands for that game um, when they did that. But, again, I was not – you know, I have not been there 
Um, they are one in four when I'm there. Um, maybe I'm a jinx or something. I don't really know. But I will say this. You know, they, they're going to have to get it together because, like I said, Cincinnati, um, you know, they don't, they don't give up a lot. But it's just they don't, guys. They're on a seven-game winning streak. Uh, they will be on the road. Their one loss to come in Columbus against the Buckeyes. But, I mean, outside of that, they, you know, they are, you know, it, it, it's just, it's rough, guys. It, it, this is going to be rough. And, and this might be the only winnable game they have left. I mean, in, in all reality, this might be the only game they have left that, that's, that they can win moving forward because they're not going to beat Memphis. And UCF is, you know, we, we don't know. I mean, again, it's on the road in Orlando, in the bounce house. I don't know. I mean, if UCF loses another game before we get to that point, you know, that that's a different story. I mean, I can look ahead and see what – let's look at UCF's um, road before they play USF. Um, they have Tulane coming up this Saturday uh, – I'm sorry, they have a bye week. They don't play again until the 23rd. So they have a bye week um, coming up this weekend. So they have a bye week. They have two games left. They have Tulane and USF, and they have one road game and one home game. The home game is on Black Friday against uh, the Bulls. So it, it, maybe that game will be a little bit more exciting to see, but the Bulls would still have to beat either Memphis or Cincinnati to have a shot to be at a bowl game. And, it would be nice to beat our rivals to get into a bowl game. I just – the way that I saw them play against Temple, it's just – guys, I mean, it, it, it leaves a lot of questions because Temple lost to UCF 63-21. to So, I mean, the Temple is very beatable. I mean, they had three losses coming into the game against USF. We just came out and played flat. We came out and played – uninspired as my friend Adam said on my podcast earlier today, uninspired football. And we're playing uninspired football. And maybe it's gotten to the point now where the players just don't want to play for Charlie Strong anymore. Maybe it's gotten to that point where they don't want to play for him anymore. It, it, it could be. I mean, I, I, I hate to say that, you know, I really honestly hate to say that, but maybe it's gotten to the point where they don't want to play for Charlie Strong no more. It could very likely be they don't want to play for him anymore. And it's sad to say that, but it comes down to it, and it might be that way. It might be the fact that they just don't want to play for him anymore, and this season could be lost. And if they fire him, I don't know who they're going to hire. Kerwin Bell could be the next coach. I mean, if they do fire him, I would hope that they would give Jim Levitt a second chance. I doubt that, though. Um, but he was the most winningest coach here. A lot of people are calling for Willie Taggart to come back. I don't think that'll happen. Uh, Taggart's record since he left USF hasn't been that good because he went to Oregon, and that didn't go very well. After He just got fired from Florida State after two seasons. That didn't go very well. So I don't know if bringing him back here will do any, will do any help. I don't know. There really right now isn't a coach out there if they decide to go that route. And it's just disappointing because, again, you know, it's a small program. They're trying to get an indoor uh, practice facility built for USF. Unfortunately, you know, at the game, they, they, they you know, put up signs. They, that they're, they're taking donations to, to build the, the indoor stadium or indoor, sorry, indoor, stadium, indoor practice facility. But if you have to pay Charlie Strong a buyout, that's where all that money is going to go. So, I mean, I don't know what, what's going to happen, you know, with that. But, I mean, for the long haul, this is not going to be an easy game for USF to win. They're going to have to play tight. I watched the press conference today on YouTube, uh, Charlie Strong's, you know, press conference with, with, for Cincinnati. And, you know, they have two group running backs that run the ball. They're, they're, they run the ball very well. They play defensively very well. Uh, USF could not protect Jordan McLeod against Temple. Look for Cincinnati to do the same exact thing that Temple did. Blitzing and, and making sure – I don't know how many third downs, guys, I saw where Jordan McLeod got sacked on third down and, you know, we had to punt. You know, that's going to have to stop, and that's going to have to stop. If they're going to beat the Bearcats this Saturday, that is going to have to stop. 
I mean, that's just the way it is, guys. They're they're just they're gonna the mistakes. They're gonna have to play inspired football. They're gonna have to get away from these mistakes. If they do not do that then it's going to lead to another loss. We might lose the final three games and finish the season four and eight. And that's disappointing because this team could easily have, and there have been a few games that, you know, a, a pass goes this way or a penalty goes that way, whatever it might be. And it's just, that's not the, it's not the way it's, it's, it's going to go. So guys, I, I'll be there. Um, you know, if any of you guys want to you know, come to the U.S., the USF game, message me on Facebook. I'll be more than happy to come down during the game and, and talk to you, shake hands with you, whatever. That would be kind of cool to meet some fans if you guys decide to go. You know, just message me on Facebook. I'll come down, you know, at halftime or I'll meet you before or after the game. Uh, that would be pretty cool to kind of meet some fans uh, that out in person outside of here. But I'm going to leave it at that, guys, that, you know, the USF, does play Cincinnati this Saturday. Let's see if they can bounce back from the uh, laying the egg game last Thursday night against Temple. Um, the next uh, team I want to talk about is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And in front of me, I have the Tampa Bay Times. I'm going to flash this up here. As you can see, the article written today says, better lucky. Um, the Buccaneers did get a win yesterday. The first. This is the first time since... 2007, 2018, that they've won at home. They were 0-4 so far this year at Raymond James Stadium. They finally got a win yesterday, uh, beating the Cardinals 30-27. Uh, to um, It was a back-and-forth game. Uh, the Bucks got a big turnover late in the game. Kyler Murray threw an interception. Um, but, you know, there were mistakes made. But somehow, someway, the Bucks found a way to win it in the end. They got out of there with a win. Um, the ground game looked good yesterday. Again, Ronald Jones has been – he has to be one of, or the not the biggest surprise this year so far for the Bucks, in my opinion. It, it has to be – it has to be him coming down to the fact that he, you know, he himself, you know, last year was ridiculed. He couldn't carry the ball. He couldn't catch the ball. He couldn't do anything right. And now this year he has emerged and come out. Um, the one thing that I, that was mentioned yesterday, you know, watching Fox, is what Coach Bruce Arian said that what he likes about Ronald Jones is that he has developed patience. He's waiting for the holes to develop, waiting for his blockers to get in front of him. That has completely changed the way he has been running the game. Running the running his his part of the running game has changed. That's why he is getting starts over Peyton Barber because he has changed his game. And this is what the Bucs needed, you know, back in week one. This takes the pressure off of James Winston. This takes the pressure off of him making, you know, less turnovers, less mistakes because you're not leaning the whole game on him. You know, now you have to say to yourself, okay, we can go ahead. We have a decent running game and let's do it. And they did that yesterday against Arizona. They also brought back, and I saw O.J. Howard have some catches yesterday. That was the first time since he came off injury. I think he had a touchdown catch yesterday. It's amazing that, you know, a team, Arizona, struggles covering a tight end. Well, they did. They used that yesterday. Uh, offensive coordinator Byron Leftwich find, found a way to entice and get him into the – get him in and involve him in – the offense yesterday, and it was nice to see that. It was nice to see the Bucks moving the ball very well. The defense came up big. They had some sacks. Shaq Barrett, again, you know, shined very well. There was a miscommunication between Vita Vea and Jason Pierre-Paul. If you guys didn't get a chance to watch the football game, there was a confrontation on the sidelines where Jason Pierre-Paul really got kind of upset with Vita Vea because according to what I heard – the, the post game with, with Pierre Paul, he said that he called out to Vita Vea. But he didn't know what the play was. Vita Vea didn't answer him. So when they got to the sidelines, he scolded the kid. This is Vita, only Vita Vea's second year, guys. So he scolded him and said, hey, man, you got to let me know what the play call is. you got to call out my name. you got to let me know what's going on moving forward. So that was mended over very well. Uh, Vita Vey has been a strong presence all season long again. Uh, he was towards the end of the season last year. 
And now this year, he once again has emerged as, you know, you know, being there in the middle and stuff like that has been, you know, outstanding, you know, outstanding um, so far this year. So that's been one of those things that's been great, um, you know, moving forward. That's been, you know, that's been great, you know, and that'll help the defense as well. I mean, it, it there was a, of course, an interesting call down the stretch. It was a pass interference call against Vernon Hargraves who has struggled again all season. I don't see him in a Buccaneer uniform next year, guys. I just don't. They got some young young guys in the secondary, and Jamal Dean and, uh, you know, you know uh, Sean, Murphy, uh, Sean Murphy Bunting, another rookie. This is just one of those things, guys, where they have a lot of people in, the, in that secondary that are rookies that is going to take some time, and that's definitely the weakness of this defense. The front seven are, are, are solid. You have Levante David, and you got, you know, Vita Vea, you know, Jason Pierre-Paul coming off injury. You have a Dominic Sue, who's been a great addition here. You have, you know, just an absolute dynamic, you know, front seven that you like. Um, and, you know, just, you know, I mean, it, it's, been, it's been great as a – the offensive, you know, the, the defensive – Part of the – of um, hang on, guys. I'm looking up a uh, player here I'm missing. Hang on a second that I wanted to mention. Um, Devin White is the guy that I was looking for. Um, but Devin White has been another good – you know, obviously, you know, we all thought as Bucks fans that maybe that wasn't the right pick. They should have went and got Josh Allen, um, the kid out of Kentucky. And I, if I got the name wrong, I'm, you know, sorry about that. But they, 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 you know, they wanted to go and get somebody like that. But come to find out, Devin White has been an absolute, you know, asset. He's getting better as the weeks go by. As the weeks go by, he's getting better. He's making sure tackles. He's making plays. This is what I think we all thought he was going to be. You add him, you add Levante David to that as well, who's one of the, you know, sure handle uh, linebacker, tackling linebackers in all of sports. So, the front seven are solid. It's just if they could sure up the back end of that defense, and it might take, you know, in, during the offseason, might be trading away, getting rid of some, you know, high-priced players. Some salaries will have to be cut for them to go out and get some of these guys, maybe draft some more guys. I don't really know. That'll be up to – that, of course, will be up to Bruce Arians when we get to the offseason. But for them to win, you know, was great. They, they got the win. They finally got a win. Now – on the flip side of it, as we roll into this, they welcome in the Saints, who, if you guys didn't see yesterday, lost at home to the Atlanta Falcons. And the Falcons only got their second win of the season yesterday, and that was over the Saints. That had to be an absolute upset because I don't think a lot of us at Atlanta picked to win. But now the Saints come into town, and unlike last week where there was really – there was a lot of Bucks fans there. Trust me, this week there will be a lot of Saints fans in the stands. I have been to a Bucks Saints game in the past. There are a lot of fans that show up in their in their gold and black. There will be a lot of Saints fans there coming in this week. And you know what? Maybe maybe the if the Bucks play again, if they like they did last week, you know, against Arizona, stay away from making minimal mistakes. They'll have a shot. But remember, you, you now you have – now the best part about the defense so far this year has been, of course, stopping the run. Well, now they're going to have uh, Alan Kamara to have to stop, Alvin Kamara to stop. They're going to have to stop him. They've done very well with stopping the run, but you got to contain him and Drew Brees, and you got to you – know, you got Michael Thomas and company too as well. So it's going to be a little bit more of a more problematic game this week um, for them. The, you know, the Saints will not be an easy opponent. They're not going to be. This, the, it's not going to be an easy opponent um, for them, you know, plain and simple. It's just it's, it's not. They're not. It's not going to be as easy as, as they all, you know, as it was against Arizona. Um, they're going to have to tighten up. I believe that they will have 
you know, a chance to win. You know, I, I'm going to say that they they will they will have a chance to win the game. I'm not saying that they don't. Um, so I mean, they have an outside shot because you know every you know every week you know you never know what might happen. I mean, let's look at this past week in college football, and this is not Florida related. But the Minnesota Golden Gophers beat Penn State, who was an, at the time was the number four team in the country. So anything can happen, guys. And like I said, Atlanta went down to New Orleans last week and beat the Saints at, on the road. So, I mean, anything can happen in the league, guys. And maybe the, the Bucs, if they play solid, maybe they can um, run the ball like they've been doing. You know, it, it, it can happen, man. I mean, it, it can definitely, definitely happen. Um, and maybe they can use the, you know, you know, the, the confidence from this win, they're going to be back home again this week. So that's, that's a good thing. At least, you know, for Bucks fans sake, for the ones that go out and attend all the games, you're going to be able to see your team at home again for two weeks in a row. It was, you know, late September was the last time they were home prior to this past Sunday and prior to yesterday. So, I mean, it just, again, was, you know, it's, Utterly, the, the scheduling guys in the NFL really came out and screwed the Bucks. The guy apologized. Um, but, again, that, again, I'm assuming will not happen in the 2020 season. <laughs> Next year, there won't be a huge gap between, um, you know, games like they've had. You know, they went to London and all that stuff. So, it's, it's going to come down to the point now where they, they, they've got to just – you know, stay together, you know, use the, use the win, you know, confidence in the win yesterday, run the ball like they did yesterday against Arizona, you know, keep the saints, you know, keep blitzing like they've done that, but, you know, make sure when you blitz the saints that you keep, you get there because they'll make you pay. Like I said, Kamara, Michael Thomas, just to name a few, they drew Brees, they will make you pay. So you have to make sure that you get to, the quarterback, you're going to blitz and they're going to have to stay in their gaps, make sure that, you know, that everyone does their job. If they can do that, you know, there might be another win. Another win could be coming this Sunday. Um, you know, it's a one o'clock kickoff. So, I mean, again, you know, they had a lot of four o'clock kickoffs early in the season too. And again, they were in London. So again, guys coming home, one o'clock start, you know, it, it, it's going to come down to the point where, you know, it is what it is. So, again, we'll, we'll just have to kind of wait and see, um, you know, how that goes. But, you know, again, got a win yesterday, 30 to 27. Use the momentum. They got the Saints coming in um, this upcoming Sunday. So, again, guys, let's hope that they can put another W up there. Moving forward, maybe they can end the season at uh, at six and ten or seven and eleven. I mean, that's a possibility. Anything better, anything better than five and eleven, which they finished the last two seasons at, if they can get to six wins, get to seven wins. That would be great. Uh, to finish at seven and nine or six and ten, that would be great. If they can somehow get to one of those two records, they do have the Falcons and the Jaguars. They have Atlanta twice, and they have the Jaguars down the stretch, which those look on paper, guys, like winnable games, but again, they still have to play them. You still got to play those games when it comes down to it. So they still have to play those games. They have, of course, like I said, they got the Saints, and then they have the Indianapolis Colts, which I'm kind of hoping that I get a chance to go see that game. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to, you know, again, wait and see what happens. But again, th this team definitely has a chance to finish better than 5-11. and 11. They're, they're, they are. They do have that opportunity to finish better than 5-11. and 11. So let's hope that they can use the momentum this week, maybe pull off another upset. You know, maybe, maybe give the Saints their third loss of the season. Hey, Atlanta did it. So, you know, get, you know let's, let's hope that, you know, that they, they can find a way to beat the Saints and, you know, the Bucs will get another W this upcoming Sunday. All right, guys, so the next thing I wanted to, to dive into – um, um, was the Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, they just, um, if you guys did not know, 
last Thursday, I'm sorry, last Friday and Saturday, they were on the road. Now, they did have a home game over there, but they were on the road in Sweden for the Global Series. NHL Global Series took place. Um, and they were in Sweden. And if you guys don't know, um, Victor Hedman, our defenseman, is from that country. So it was exciting for him to get back to his home country. He was hurt going into this and um, he was hurt, but he got back. He got healthy. They went into the game. Um, Friday's game was, they were the, they were the row team on Friday in which they won three to two. Um, they jumped out to a uh, two nothing. I believe they were up two nothing early on. Let me pull that up here again, real quick. Let me see. I believe they jumped out to a two nothing lead before the Sabers got got um, any got goals. Here, let me see. Yes, uh, after the first period, they were up two nothing. After the first, the Sabers scored one goal in the second. The Lightning had none, and then of course. They both had a goal in the third period, uh, three to two. So, again, they edged them out there. And then uh, the next game that they had was on Saturday. That was a one o'clock uh, drop of the puck here in the States. It was, of course, over there. It was in the middle of the night, and they were able to win five to three in that game. Um, that game, they were up five to three. Uh, let me go back and take a look at when their goals. I believe they scored three goals in the third period. I'm sorry, they only scored two. They scored one in the first, two in the second, and two in the third. I thought they had scored three in the third. I was incorrect. Okay, so I told my buddy that they had scored three in the third period. They did not. They only scored two in the third. So they had one goal in the first, two in the second, two in the third, and they won the game five to three. Now, this is big because the Buffalo Sabres – were the top team, you know, in the conference uh, leading in. I mean, Buffalo, they're one of the top teams. Boston, I believe, is the, is the top team um, in the division. Let's take a look here real quick. Um, bringing up the, the stats here to um, see, see here. I believe – yeah, okay, see, Boston – Boston um, – Boston's uh, on top right now. The Lightning and the Sabres. The Lightning are seven points behind Boston, but have two games in hand. The Sabres are five points behind, but have played the same amount of games that the Bruins have played so far. So we only sit two points behind Buffalo for the fifth spot. We're only three points behind state rival Florida. And that will put us, if we were to win, this upcoming Thursday, we have a game against the Rangers. I will be there personally. We did not play very well against the Rangers the last time we played them. If you remember correctly, it did not go very well. Uh, we lost 4-1 to in Madison Square Garden. So we're going to have to come out a little bit better um, against them this time around. But we'll be at home instead of on the road, which would be nice. Um, but the, the, the funny thing is um, you have – um, you know, we're not far out of it again, guys, like I said last week, you know, let's not, let's not push the, you know, let's not push the panic button yet. We're still early in the season. Let's not push the panic button yet. This team played very well, both games on the road in Sweden. So I'm going to say they're on the road, even though they were the home team in game two, it was not here in Tampa. It was not here in the state. So they were on the road. He's not here at Amway Arena. So, to me, they were on the road. They won both games. They played solid in both games, which is good because it looks like they're starting to turn the corner a little bit. And, guys, you know, I have talked to some experts here in Tampa Bay. Maybe they haven't found their identity yet. I listened to uh, Lightning Power Play and iHeartRadio. If you're a Lightning fan out there, get the iHeartRadio app. Go on there. All those shows on there are freaking cool. Go on there and listen to them because then you get so many different points of view that it's it's amazing how many points of view you get. You get you know, Dave Michigan's point of view, who's the play-by-play -play radio guy, one of the best in the business. You get, you know, a female perspective. 
you get, you know, a guy who is who his sons play hockey. You get their perspective of what's going on. You get Eric Erlingson, who's a lightning insider. He's one of the closest to the team. You get a lot, you get uh, Jay Retcher, who's on 620 WDAE. You get his perspective as well. So, guys, there's a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of perspective on that on that app. Go on there if you're a Lightning fan, and I, I didn't listen to it till about about two weeks ago when I was when I got sick. But I, I've listened to it at work. I get an opportunity, I listen to it at work. It's for lightning fans, go on there because it's 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 just a freaking awesome way to catch up on all things lightning. And guys, not to jump back, but USF has their own channel on there as well called Bulls Unlimited. They have two channels where they will air football and talk, and then they'll air all of USF's games. I'm talking soccer, volleyball, baseball, softball. They're all on there. They are all on there. If you're interested in listening to USF sports, again, that would be some – iHeartRadio is badass anyway. Let me just throw that out there. It's a badass app. Um, but, again, guys, the, the, the thing is when it comes down to it, it – the Lightning are, are starting to – to bounce back here maybe they found their identity you know maybe th these two games you know in sweden was something that they needed you know kind of as a as a as um confidence that they could build um towards um getting back on track or getting or finding the identity that we all know and expect to happen now, again, guys, they don't play until Thursday. We're, we're on Mondays. So they have the next today off, tomorrow, and Wednesday. Now, I'm not saying that they're not practicing. What I'm saying is there's no games until Thursday night. We get back to normal hockey weeks starting next week. This week, we have two games. We have a game on Thursday night against the Rangers and then a game at home against Winnipeg on Saturday. Outside of that, Outside of that, we get back to a normal calendar where we're not – we don't have a game and then have four days off. Or we have a game we got, you know, three days off. Or, like, the last game we played was Friday. So, it'll, it's almost going to be almost a week before we play again. Starting the week of the 18th, we're back to a normal schedule where we're playing three games a week or four games a week. This is where I think now they're going to start catching up on games played. I also believe they're going to be able to gel more as a unit. So if you look at that week, the week of the 18th, guys, they're on the road against the defending Stanley Cup champion, St. Louis Blues. So they're on the road there. They go to Chicago to play the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, then they come home to play the Anaheim Ducks on the 23rd. So... To me, um, to me, that um, is something else right there. So they come home to play Anaheim, and they're at home for three. They got Buffalo, which is which is kind of surprising me. They're going to play the Buffalo Sabers three times in the month of November. The next game they play Buffalo is on New Year's Eve in January on the thirty first. So they're home. They got three games the week of the 18th. The week of the 25th, they have four games. They have Buffalo at home, St. Louis at home. They travel to Washington. Then they come home the next night to play the Carolina Hurricanes. And that will round out the month of November. If we flip the calendar, guys, to December, like I said, everything goes back to normal. They have three games the week of December 2nd. They're at Nashville, home against the Wild, home against the Sharks. Then the week after that, they play the Islanders at home. They travel to Sunrise to play the Panthers. They're at home against the Bruins, home against the Capitals. Then they have, a, again, they have a couple of days off, and they have another three-game three game week. They're at home against Ottawa and Dallas the week of the 16th, and they go on the road the week before Christmas, to play the Washington Capitals. They come home 
have one game against the, the Panthers before they have a four-game break for the Christmas holiday. They're at home to play Montreal and Detroit. Then, like I said, on New Year's Eve, December 31st, to 7 o'clock drop of the puck, they're in Buffalo to play the, the Buffalo Sabres. That'll be the fourth and the last game they play Buffalo. They will have the Sabres done in the first three months of the season. They will have the Florida Panthers done in the first three months of the season as well. Because both the games, they played Florida on opening night. Then the next, you know, two days later, they went to Sunrise. So they will have two division rivals done in a matter of the first uh, three months of the season, which at this, previ- at this present moment, both of them are ahead of them in the standings. Both Florida and Buffalo both are ahead of them in the standings as we speak, but they will have all four games against the Panthers, which they are one and one against, and all four games against the Sabres, which they're two and zero against, all done in a matter of the first three months of the season. So that will be interesting to have, you know, then all you have left then, of course, would be the Bostons, the Montreals, the Ottawa's, the Detroit's, teams like that that are still on the schedule that are there. But again, guys, like I said, when you turn the calendar to the later months, Everything comes back to normal for them. They have, you know, two days after they play Buffalo, they're in Montreal on January 2nd. They're at Ottawa, and they're at Carolina to begin the week of January 5th. They're home against Vancouver, home against the Coyotes, and they go to Philly and to New Jersey. The week of the 13th of January, they're home, they are have one home game that week against the Kings, and they're on the road to play Minnesota and Winnipeg. Then there's a long break, which is the all-star break. Then they go to the West Coast to play at Dallas. Well, I wouldn't call Dallas the West Coast, but they're playing Dallas. Then they go to L.A. and Anaheim. That's the West Coast right there, guys. That's the West Coast trip at the end of January, and they finish it up on February 1st against the Sharks. Then they have a good homestand coming up the first, first full weekend in February where you have the Knights, the Penguins, and the Islanders all at home, three straight home games. And then, again, we have back-to-back the following week against the Blue Jackets and the Penguins on the road, come home to play the Oilers and the Flyers, then go back out west again to play the Avalanche, Knights, and Coyotes. So they make West Coast trip at the end of January and the middle to the end of February. They make one more West Coast trip. Then they come home to play the Leafs, Blackhawks, and Flames to round out the month of February. As we flip the counter to March, they're at home against Boston, at home against the Montreal Canadiens. Then they go on the road to play Boston, Detroit, and Toronto. They're home against the Flyers, home against the Red Wings on Saturday, the 14th, which is Valence, which is March 14th. That's March 14th. They're home against the Devils, and they go on the road to play Vancouver, Edmonton, and Calgary, so the Canadian trip happens. They have three days off after that to come home to play Toronto, Columbus, the Rangers, and then the the Ottawa Senators to end March. Flipping the counter to the final month of the year, they're on the road. They have two road games on the second and fourth at Columbus, and then at the Red Wings on April 4th. But again, like I said, guys, the reason that I fast-forwarded that far ahead is, as you can see, early off in the season, the team would have one game, and they'd have, you know, other than opening night where they had the one, and then they had a day off, and then they went, you know, to sunrise. They, you know, for the for the life of me, you know, it's been that kind of way where they play one game, and they have four day, four days off. So with that in mind, with that in mind, the, the schedule gets back to normal as they come back from Sweden, riding a two-game winning streak. They come back. I'll be at the game myself on Thursday night to see if they can get some revenge on the Rangers from when we played them at Madison Square Garden. So let's see what happens. They played two solid games in Sweden against the Sabres. They needed those four points. They got the four points they needed to do to come back home and start the 
regular part of their schedule. I'm going to say that because, again, like I said, I know October was not really the regular part because the fact of the matter is when you're on the road, as much as they were and you're only playing one game every three days or one game every five days, it makes it very, very hard for you to gel as a team. Now that, as I've gone through the calendar, from here on out, except for the all-star break and around the Christmas holiday, they don't have too many margin of error. They don't have a lot of days off in between games. That's going to help them in the long run. You know, and I, and I can't see that being, you know, I can't see this team being any short of what they did. Again, guys, the big goal for us, we don't have to win the President's Trophy again this year, guys. As a Lightning fan, we don't have to win the President's Trophy again. Let's get to the postseason and let's get out of the first round of the playoffs like we were supposed to last season. Let's just get out of the first round. Let's get there. If we play like we did, we did in Sweden against the, the Sabres, there will not be a problem with doing that. I promise you from what I saw, I watched both games, we will not have an issue moving forward if we play like that. Cooper's got them moving in the right direction, guys. So count on the Lightning being back in it again. If you guys happen to, you know, have a day off and, and you want to come and catch a, a, a a game, you know, man, come out and watch them play, man. I, I'm dead serious, man. Come out and watch them play. You know, it, it's great. Like I said, I will personally be there on on Thursday myself with my buddy, so I'll get some more insight on that. But, I mean, it's great that the Lightning are back on a winning, winning path. And I'm sorry that I forgot to mention this early in my show. Maybe I should open this with this, but I want to real quick – you know, as I end my show always, but I want to give a real shout out. I want to say happy Veterans Day to all the veterans out there. Thank you for what you did, for what you did, whether you're living or you're not with us anymore. Thank you for what you did. Uh, it's, it's, it's awesome that you guys sacrificed your lives, you know, for us uh, to defend our freedom. You know, this is the best country in the world to live in. You know, we have a lot of freedom that a lot of countries don't have. Um, but, I mean, for the, for, for the greatness that it is, thank you again to all the veterans out there. You know, happy Veterans Day to all you guys. Sure, maybe I should, probably should have started the show with that, but I just want to make sure I got that in there um, before my show uh, ends here. But, guys, the, the last thing I wanted to touch upon, and I don't know if I have anyone out there that is interested in this, but it would be um, – hang on a second. Let me find this. Where did it go? Uh, there it is. Um, these guys right here, guys, have a roller derby match every month, once a month, and they got done having one just this past Saturday. I attend them. If I am here, I will attend them. And I did attend them. Um, did attend the one this past week. It was one of, by far the highest scoring match I've ever been to. Um, it was a back and forth match um, through the end. Um, the team that won had my um, my good friends on both of them. Both my good friends are on the, are on the team. Um, so that was pretty cool uh, with that. That was the first time in a while. One of them happens to be my neighbor. But the other one is, is you know, I'm starting to develop a friendship with. So it was nice. And it was actually also nice to see one of the skaters that I hadn't seen in a while that she's probably, she's back on a pair of skates getting ready to get back herself. So that's awesome too. But it was just pure excitement, guys, to see. And again, this is not roller derby like you, you saw on TV where they were hitting each other with chairs or tripping. This is full athletic women in all shapes and sizes. And they bust their asses on every freaking – Every freaking, you know, time they were out there, they did it every time. And no, no matter who it was, you know, every time that they, they, they laced up, every time that the, the jams, they're called, they're called jams, every jam that they went out, everyone busted their ass. It's, it's amazing to see women who get knocked down, guys. And I imagine this as a guy. They get knocked on their butts only to get right back up and do it again. And it doesn't phase them. It's just, it's amazing to see them. And I'm wishing Deadly Rival Roller Derby the best of luck. They are going on a travel match this upcoming 
uh, Friday to Texas for Banks Diversity. I believe that's what it's called. That will be here next year. But I want to wish all of those skaters, all of them that are on the travel team, the best of luck. Kick ass. You know, that's all I'm going to say about that. You guys are good enough to win. Bring home a win. Bring home some wins. It would be freaking cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead, guys, and see if I can find a way to watch the watch the games. I'll mention that next week on Tampa Talk about um, – how the match went in Texas for them. I mean, I can go ahead and make a regular um, segment for them every week. I will talk to them about that and see if there's something that they, maybe they have some information they can pass on to me every week, maybe update on skaters, who's coming in, who's, you know, who their rookie skaters are that could be coming up soon um, and stuff like that. That would be pretty awesome. I think I can, I can very much, um, you know, go ahead and get that on this show, uh, being that they're a Tampa Bay area, uh, event they're in St. Petersburg guys. They don't play far from me. Like I said, one of them is my neighbor <laughs> who lives right above me. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool. Uh, all of them are, are, are classy people. Um, I did have a running with a fan after that. I wasn't really too appreciative of, um, but you will see in the next upcoming weeks or months, Standing behind me, if you're watching this on Facebook Live, you can see behind me there is a Sports Illustrated calendar. You can see the girl in the bikini behind me. That will be soon replaced by a framed autographed jersey by all of Delhi Rival Roller Derby. They did that for me because they call me a super fan. I do attend at least nine out of the 12 bouts every year. It's a fun time. It's inexpensive. It's only 17 bucks to go get a ticket early. It fills up rather quickly. It's a fun thing. It's a couple hours of watching ladies basically, in my opinion, skate around the track. They beat the hell out of each other. They shake hands after. They're all in good spirits. You know, they're, it's just an overall great atmosphere. It's a fun thing to watch. They they have fast skaters. They fly around the track. It's it's just it's fun to watch, guys. It's it's absolutely fun to watch. They have food there. They have beverages there. They sell merchandise. You know, if you get a chance, log on to their website, dillylateral.com. Log on there. Take take it take a look. If you're in the area, and come see me, man. I'll be I'm there. Like I said, I'm there about every about every time that they have one, I'll be there. The next one is on December 7th, which is Pearl Harbor Day. Um, I will be there um, on that day. So I, that, I'll be there the next one as well. But it's going to be interesting. Let's just say that. But with that, guys, I'm wishing the Daily Rival Roller Derby, uh, the girls, good luck in, in the tournament in Texas. I want to wish them all the best of luck. Uh, hopefully no one gets hurt. Hopefully they come back with some wins. And I will see you guys, see you ladies, you know, in December um, at the sleigh ground, which is freaking cool. Uh, but until then, guys, thank you again for coming on Tampa Talk. Uh, I'm going to end my show here. This is the sports nerd, Brad Walker. I want to, again, conclude my show as I always do, thanking the men and women of our armed services, uh, both retired and active, thank you for doing what you do, Make, letting me do this, because I would not be sitting here on this microphone, and I'm going to say microphone, being able to do this without you guys doing what you do. Thank you to our domestic soldiers, our police officers, firefighters, and paramedics. Thank you for domestically keeping us safe. Again, a happy Veterans Day to all my vets out there. Can, Thank you guys for doing what you did. You know, no matter what, you guys are always going to be soldiers, no matter what, whether you're here, whether you're gone. God bless every one of you guys, you know, for all the people that make this possible, all the people on Facebook Live for popping on this late in the evening, all of them that popped in earlier today. I want to thank Breck and Mark of Mancini Sports Network for letting me do this every Monday. Um, 
if you caught the show last week, guys, um, I had a conversation with Mark. I thought maybe this, that last week might have been my last show. The good news is, no, it's not. Um, Tampa Talk is going to be on here until I decide that I don't want to do this no more, which that's far from being that because it's pretty freaking cool that I get to do this show once a week. Um, I'm going to probably try to expand this moving forward, maybe expand it to an hour and a half, maybe two hours like my other show is. Try to get some interviews on here. I'm going to try to interview some people. And, you know, I'm going to try to take some calls. I have yet to take a phone call in the first three shows. I have yet to take a phone call yet. So, uh, get some, you know, if you're out there, let me know. I can give you the number to call in. You can come on here and we can talk, you know, talk about Tampa sports, talk about Florida sports. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's just one of those things, guys, that, you know, that thank you again for letting me do this. God bless to all you guys. And as I always say, I love every one of you for giving me the opportunity, for giving me the confidence to do this with my writing and moving now and doing this podcasting with this, with Tampa Talk and with the Walker Report. Thank you guys for, for giving me the opportunity and giving me the confidence of how great you think I am. Um, I'm starting to get better with feeling that I am great at what I do. And this is something that I feel very comfortable and something that I have a lot of fun with doing twice a week. But until next Monday, guys, this is the Sports Center Brad Walker signing off on Tampa Talk. Thank you again for joining me this evening. Good night.